So, stable isotopes. These are used a lot in, uh, in the geosciences um, and uh, other environmental sciences as well. Um, so, before we go on uh, for the, the main lecture and talk about kind of how they work, um, this is an introductory video uh, to give you a bit of background to what isotopes are and, and kind of uh, why they would fractionate against each other. So, why you would preferentially have heavy isotopes in, in some things and not, not in others. Um, which is kind of the background for ultimately why that 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 fractionation is useful. Okay, so uh, so if we uh, go on, so this is the uh, this is the kind of the introduction to that. So we're all going to be talking about isotopes. Uh, and if we, uh, if we think about what uh, what isotopes actually are, um, so an element, so in this case oxygen, um, isn't just one type of atom. So there are different types of atom of each element uh, with the same number. Of uh, protons in the uh, nucleus, same number of electrons in the in the outer shells, things like that, depending on the the chemistry that's going on. But they have different numbers of neutrons. Okay, so they have different uh, weights. Uh, so in this case, oxygen is a is made up of a combination of different isotopes. In this case, oxygen 16, 17, and 18, uh, which which basically just weigh different amounts. Okay, um, so. Another kind of like thing we're going to have to uh, just uh, just get the slides, get rid of me there. Um, uh, talk about is this this concept of delta notation. So rather than um, write down or, or measure the absolute isotope ratio, so the ratio of maybe oxygen 16 to 18 in a sample or 18 to 16 in a sample, uh, because isotope geochemists can't really measure very accurately or the real isotope ratio where we can only measure it relative to some assumed standard or in some cases known standard okay so we, we're measuring the the ratio of isotopes in, in our sample relative to the isotopes in a in a standard that every lab kind of has okay so we have this notation here this delta notation where we have the the greek symbol delta a d and then we have some superscript which is usually the heavier isotope so in the case of oxygen we'd put 18 up here. Then we have the element X that we're interested in. Okay, so in this case, oxygen. And then we have the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16 in the sample, okay, divided by the standard. So this is basically the ratio of ratios. Um, and then we have uh, a minus one in here. Um, so our, our ratio is kind of like relative to, to kind of, um, uh, uh, the, the ratio in the standard. Um, uh, we typically times uh, this ratio of isotope ratios by a thousand because the differences in isotope composition in different between different samples is typically very small. Um, so we times the ratio by a thousand to get numbers which we can kind of like uh, deal with or kind of be more uh, easily to relate to as kind of like the, our simpleton scientists that we are. Okay. Um, just to note that sometimes with isotope ratios, sometimes an isotope variation is extremely small. We might want to times this by ten thousand. Sometimes this symbol epsilon is used. Just to, just to note that that might appear in some of the, the geological literature. Um, so uh, just a quick note on some standards. Um, you can kind of, this is kind of uh, a little bit of background, but um, for each of the, the isotope systems that we might be interested in, maybe hydrogen isotopes, uh, sometimes called delta D, because rather than use uh, sub, uh, superscript two in front of the hydrogen, it's sometimes called deuterium. That's kind of unique to the hydrogen isotope system. So for different isotope systems, deuterium, lithium isotopes, boron isotopes, carbon isotopes, nitrogen isotopes, uh, we are interested in the ratio of one isotope to another in that sample perhaps, uh, and then we have some standard that we kind of like use, and sometimes this is a, um, a kind of a, uh, a something that a National Bureau of Standards has produced, so they've made a, a supply of, of boron that has got a known isotope ratio, and they distribute that to all of the isotope labs that are interested in measuring boron, and we use that similarly, so the National Bureau of Standards um, have, a, have a standard called L-spec for lithium. Okay, but sometimes the, uh, the standard is something that's related to the kind of the natural world. So, for instance, nitrogen, 
typically uses the atmospheric composition of nitrogen because that's thought to be kind of uniform and is easily available everywhere. Okay, so just, just to point out that for different isotope systems, we have a specific standard for those. Um, I won't kind of dwell on this table for too long. I'm sure none of you can read it, but there's a lot of pedantry about you know, what we call or the, the terminology used um, when referring to kind of like uh, isotopes in, in, in geosciences. Um, so the, the things like, like saying, uh, referring to an isotope uh, uh, composition where we should in fact maybe be referring to um, the value of the, the, the isotope uh, ratio uh, or saying something is isotopically depleted. Okay, I mean, it, it's not actually depleted in isotopes. It has the same number of isotopes as it would if there was no isotope change. It's, you be specific that it's depleted in a in one of the specific isotopes that you're 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 talking about. But um, you can read through this at your own kind of pleasure. It's it's not that critical to the actual science. Um, so when we're talking about uh, um, stable isotopes, there's this 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 concept of fractionation factor, and this is basically uh, a measure of how much the isotopes differ in different uh, chemical phases. Okay, so how much uh, the isotope is preferentially in, in one thing rather than another thing. Uh, so in this case we've got uh, two uh, compounds, we've got carbon dioxide and water and this is an isotope exchange reaction so it's like a chemical reaction except it has the same chemical species on both sides over here okay except that the isotopes are exchanged so we've got a carbon dioxide with oxygen 16 in, it. in this case we've got a carbon dioxide with oxygen 18 in it and water with oxygen 18 in it and um, water with oxygen 16 in it. And all this reaction represents is basically the exchange of different isotopes between water and carbon dioxide. Okay, um, So uh, we, can, we can define how those isotopes are distributed between um, carbon dioxide and water. So are we preferentially having more um, uh, more of the, the heavy isotopes in the carbon dioxide or more of the heavy isotopes in the water with this term the fractionation factor okay and that's basically defined as the fractionation factor between phase A and phase B so in this case between CO2 and water is the isotope ratio in phase A so the isotope ratio in um, the uh, carbon dioxide divided by the isotope ratio in um, the phase B, so in this case the, the isotope ratio in water, okay, and that's what's kind of kind of written here. And you can um, you can kind of measure those, or if you measure those absolutely, in, in this case you quite often find that there's a there's a there's a slight favouring, okay. So these the the isotope ratio in the carbon dioxide and the water are not quite the same, okay. So there's a slight preference for the the heavy isotope to go into one of the two phases, in this case the carbon dioxide. Okay. So the rest of the, this, this introduction will be kind of investigating, looking to why that is. Okay. Um, just uh, some more kind of like uh, kind of notation and um, uh, kind of uh, how we can manipulate some of these these uh, isotope terms. Uh, just to say that we have this kind of this term big delta. So this is a capital Greek delta. Uh, between phases A and B, and that's quite um, quite often used as basically just the difference in isotope value between two samples. So the isotope, if we have, we're measuring kind of two different samples, the the difference in isotope composition between them would be um, described uh, thus. Okay, and we'll see how this is now re related to the fractionation factor. So this is our uh, sometimes referred to as the Permille equation, or this is how we kind of like this. Have this delta notation for the the real ratio in the sample divided by the real ratio in the standard, okay, normalized um, and uh, times by a thousand, and that's that's just this written out in kind of one line here. So we can rearrange this equation here to get the ratio in the phase we're interested in as the term over here, and then we have kind of this uh, over this side. So we can then define our fractionation factor here as the ratio in one phase divided by the ratio in another phase and that's plugging in this 
part of this equation down into this thing over here. Okay, so this now gives us an equation that relates our delta values, so using the notation that we, we use as kind of geoscientists, and this fractionation factor. Okay, so we can then uh, we can kind of rearrange this uh, as we kind of like wish, okay, we, uh, just to try and um, simplify it a little bit. And you can go through this in your own time. But uh, essentially, we've now got, uh, if we um, rearrange to this equation down here, we've got alpha the fractionation factor minus one. Uh, and this is basically the difference between phase phase A and phase B, which is kind of that big delta. Now, uh, because the fractionation factors are usually quite small, okay, that means that these delta values are usually quite close to zero. Okay, so they're maybe you know between ten and minus ten. Okay, so that means that we can approximate this term at the bottom. Okay, this is a number near zero plus a thousand is approximately equal to a thousand. Okay, so that gives us this kind of equation here, which we can then rearrange to this guy here, where the um, uh, delta A minus delta B, so big delta, is approximately equal to alpha minus one times um, 10 to the power of three. Okay? And when, uh, um, say, alpha minus one, when alpha is, is quite close to one, this term here can actually be approximated quite nicely to uh, log alpha. And we'll see later why this kind of approximation is useful. Okay, so these approximations that we've made here are, are kind of valid where the fractionation factor is, is close to one, so we have small changes in isotope ratio. Okay, so uh, we're going to have a little bit of a deviation now and uh, talk a little bit about why isotopes um, fractionate. Um, so there are two um, types of isotope fractionation. Uh, one of them is equilibrium isotope fractionation, and the other is kinetic isotope fractionation. Okay, so just bear in mind that there are these two types, um, and we'll, we'll hopefully um, kind of explain these 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 through uh, this introduction and the um, and the lecture. Okay, so uh, moving on to the uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so before we go on and explain. Uh, why isotopes fractionate, we've got to go into kind of how chemical bonds actually behave uh, because it's these breaking and forming of chemical bonds that basically are the, the what happens when you do a chemical reaction. Okay, so understanding these is important for knowing why isotopes might be different as we like to form a different kind of chemical reaction. Uh, yeah, so we, when we do some chemistry in the environment, there will be an isotope fractionation, and that isotope fractionation is due to the bonding environment. Okay, so this is just a little diagram showing, or some a, a GIF I've stolen from Wikipedia, it's just showing that, that in a in a molecule you can have lots of different types of vibration. Okay, so things can be kind of like stretching out, or backwards and forwards, or all kinds of different. And it the the numbers of different types of vibration, okay, depends on the type and shape of the molecule. Um, so if you have a very simple molecule, some of these types of um, orientations or geometries of vibration can't happen. Okay, um, okay so I'm just gonna, just gonna simplify, simplify all of those vibrations, all of those different types of vibrations to a simple kind of ball on a string. So basically two molecules kind of bouncing backwards and forwards. Okay, and this can only really have one mode of, you can't have twisting in this because you can't twist a kind of a one dimensional bond or you can't scissor it or anything. That. Okay, so imagine we've got we've simplified our our, our our bond. In this case, this is maybe some maybe a nitrogen atom, uh, nitrogen molecule. Okay, and this is just bouncing. These uh, two atoms are just bouncing backwards and forwards. Okay, and we can represent that by basically a, a ball on a string. Okay, and over time that ball will bounce up and bounce down, bounce up and bounce down, and we can describe that kind of ball bouncing up and down with some really simple physics. Okay, so there, there, there will be some kind of like um, uh, wave number T of that um, of that, vib that, that, that vibration, okay, which will kind of define the frequency of the vibration. Okay, and in, and in kind of molecular kind of chemistry, molecular bond vibration, sometimes F, the frequency of vibration is sometimes really referred to as 
the classical vibration frequency, or sometimes referred to as V. Okay, um, so F and V are the same thing. Don't don't worry about that. Not too not too important. Um, but uh, we uh, have also got uh, some other. We've got the amplitude of this. That's not turning out to be so important. So this is how how strong the thing is vibrating up and down. But it turns out that this frequency of vibration is dependent on how strong this spring is. Okay, you imagine if you had a, a very very strong spring, this would maybe vibrate quite quickly. We had a, a, a very weak spring, might bounce up and down quite slowly like that. Okay, and it's dependent on m, the mass of our ball on the end of the spring. Okay, so uh, there is a slight caveat to this, in that um, in a molecule we tend to have two atoms on the end of the spring. So rather than just have the mass of the spring, we have this term mu. Okay, which is referred to as the um, reduced mass okay so it's basically dependent on the mass of one end and the mass on the other end okay using this this equation here okay um, so we then have a, an equation where we've got our the frequency of vibration okay it's related to so it's 1 over 2 pi okay and that's due to kind of going up and down that uh, times the square root of k which we can think of as, as kind of like the spring constant or the kind of like the strength of the bond um, and mu, so that the reduced mass. Okay, so um, so there's that. So this is uh, this is another diagram to kind of like show what's going on here. So we might have some bond, okay, that's, that's bouncing backwards and forwards here, um, and this is kind of like a uh, an energy diagram. So this is at the along the bottom here. We've got the the length of the bond. Okay, and you can see if you vibrate the bond more and more and more, we kind of move up this diagram here. Okay, and this is energy on the top here, on the on the vertical axis. So as we start adding energy, we start vibrating the bond more and more backwards across here until we get to somewhere up here where we're vibrating it so much it can basically break the bond. Okay, um, so. The kind of the distance between up here and the lowest energy state where our atom is not vibrating much at all it's going slowly backwards and forwards a short distance to here that can be thought of as that distance can be thought of as the bond strength okay but um because of quantum mechanics um you can't be anywhere on this diagram okay you can only be at discrete amounts of energy okay and these these things are actually very very close together um so the, the, the amount of energy that you have at the lowest state can be um, defined by this equation up here, where you've got Planck's constant, uh, which is this kind of ridiculously small number here, times the vibrational frequency divided by two. So that defines how much energy we can have here. And then for each one of these energy levels, that's very simply this equation, okay, times another n. So every time you go up, you add one to this thing here, and that defines the, the distance between each one of these energy levels. Okay, and this is quite important because this shows that the energy or the, the precise energy level here uh, relies, or, or at least in part, on the vibrational frequency of the bond, which is, if you can go back down here, has got a term in it mu, which is dependent on the mass of the basically isotopes at each end of that bond. Okay, so we can go through and look at an example of that. So for um, uh, this is for the bond hydrogen hydrogen or hydrogen deuterium. So this is kind of mass two or even deuterium deuterium. So that's got a, a mass two on each end. We just ignore that one for now. Um, but we can work out what the um, the the energy is, uh, or at least the energy difference between each of these potential lowest possible states. Okay, so we can work out the vibrational frequency. Okay, so let's use this equation here: vibrational frequency one over two pi times k, spring constant or bond strength or something like that, um, divided by mu, the reduced mass. Okay, we can do the same thing for the HD bond. Now, even if we don't know what the k value is here, what we can do is we can combine these two equations to work out what the relative difference basically the ratio of these two vibrational frequencies is. Okay, uh, so that's just kind of uh, this equation divided by this equation. 
and that gives us um, that gives us this guy down here, and we can quite easily work out what mu is here. Okay. Uh, so for a HH ones, that's kind of mass one times mass one divided by uh, one plus one, so that's a half. Um, and for here we've got two divided by three, so that's kind of two thirds. Okay. So that means that the, the ratio of the vibrational frequencies between these guys here is the square root of three quarters. Okay. So that's all very well and good, but we can take this a step further and then go back to that, that Planck equation, okay, where the energy is equal to Planck constant times the vibrational frequency divided by two and work out the difference in energy between these two possible lowest energy states of the bond. So basically the difference in the bond strengths. Okay, in this case, we've got uh, the energy for the HH bond and the energy for the HD bond Okay, and we can we can start to plug numbers into those um, in that we don't actually know what the well we can well we've got this term I'll just go back a slide we've got this here is the same as this here and all we're doing now is we're substituting in we don't know what the vibrational frequency of HD uh, is the hydrogen deuterium bond but we do know what it is relative to the the hydrogen hydrogen bond. Okay, so that's what's that's plugged in here. So we've now can rearrange that equation to work out the difference in energy between those two things is uh, Planck's constant times the vibrational frequency of the hydrogen hydrogen bond divided by two, and then there's this thing over here. Okay, so uh, if we know all we do need to know now is what the basically the um, uh, the um, uh, vibrational frequency of, of this um, this guy is here, and we can we can do that. We if we know um, so that the fundamental vibration frequency is this this omega term, which if we uh, if we whiz back, okay, we, we've got this this term that remains relates the fundamental frequency to the kind of the actual frequency, which is times the speed of light. So we, we, we plug plug these numbers into into this equation up here, okay, which you can kind of do at your own leisure. And it works out that we get so many kind of like tiny amounts of joules per molecule difference between the bond strengths. And when that you know times that by the number of atoms uh, or molecules in a mole, we end up with 3.5 kilojoules per mole difference in the bond strength if you've got a hydrogen hydrogen and a hydrogen deuterium. Now that's significant uh, because if you've got a difference in the bond strength, that makes the heavier isotopes harder to break those bonds. Okay, so if you're if you're heavy, you form stronger bonds. If you're if you're less heavy, I guess you, you're still quite strong, but you, you, you have less uh, lifting power. You, you've got less it's holding you together. Okay, and this is really important because uh, of the Arrhenius relationship, which is this equation here. Um, which, which tells us that the, the activation energy is very important okay, in determining reaction rates. So in this case, we've got, this is the reaction rate. So unfortunately, K here is used for something else. So this is now no longer the kind of like the spring constant term. This is the reaction rate. Okay, and K will come up again. It'll be something else, which is kind of annoying part of thermodynamics. But is the reaction rate is equal to some constant times E to the power of minus Activation energy times, uh, or oh, sorry, divided by the gas constant times temperature. So this, so if this is a uh, big number, uh, this will be a um, uh, this this reaction will go slower. Okay. Um, so this is this is kind of important because is it? Yeah, this is yeah, this is definitely important. So imagine if you have uh, two reactions, one that's that's going on with kind of one isotope, say the oxygen eighteen, and the other that's going on with the oxygen sixteen. Okay, if you have reactions that are going at different rates, the oxygen sixteen will react faster, so it will reach the finish line first. Okay, and then the oxygen eighteen will kind of like react and complete its reaction later on. Now this isn't this isn't an issue. We'd get no isotope fractionation if the reaction's completed, 
okay, and you had no products left, no, sorry, no reactants left, and you converted everything into the into the products, okay, because then it, you, all of the isotopes you started with would be at the finish. But imagine if you your reaction only went halfway, okay, uh, more of the oxygen sixteen would react because it has a lower activation energy, it goes faster, get to the finish. Um, than your oxygen 18, so your products, okay, would be enriched in the lighter isotope, okay, because of this reaction rate control on um, uh, reaction rate control from the the different bond strengths in due to the different isotopes. Okay, so that that was kind of a little bit about kinetic isotopes, and we'll do more about that in the lecture. I want to talk now about uh, equilibrium reactions. Okay, so this this is a case where uh, you've got maybe a chemical reaction that doesn't go all the way. So you, you still have some of the the, the the reactants left. You have some products, and they're they're constantly exchanging with each other. Okay, going backwards and forwards, and you reach some kind of equilibrium. Okay, now the question here is, you know, if we if we don't kind of go all the way. Okay, if, we, if, we, if we're constantly exchanging isotopes backwards and forwards with products and reactants, does that lead to an isotope fraction issue? Okay. So to think about this, uh, we're going to have to think about these things called isotope reactions. So I showed these uh, briefly before. We, so we have, in this case, we have two phases. Okay, so we have water, okay, water H2O, and also HDO. So this is water with a, a deuterium. Uh, atom instead of a hydrogen atom in, in one of the, the sites. And we've got hydrogen sulfide, okay, which is here as well, and one of the hydrogens is replaced with a deuterium. Okay, so we've got the same chemical species on both sides, but all we're doing is we're exchanging the isotopes backwards and forwards with each other. Okay? So you can think of uh, this now as a normal kind of chemical reaction where we might write and get an equilibrium constant. Okay, sorry again, this is another K uh, for meaning something else. Where we, we put the kind of reactants over the products, okay, and that gives us an equilibrium constant, but in this case, not for the chemistry, but for the exchange of the isotopes, okay. So this is often referred to as alpha. This is the fractionation factor, and if we kind of look at how these might be rearranged, we've got the uh, um, uh, water, so this is water with deuterium. This is water with just hydrogen, so that's the same as this, okay, and this is the same as this. So this is can be rearranged to be the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in water divided by the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in hydrogen sulfide. Now, this is a kind of a special case reaction, uh, this example with, with water and hydrogen sulfide, because the fractionation factor is huge. So usually these numbers are very close to one, okay, but this is a, a strange example where the fractionation factor is actually much, much different to one. Okay? So we need to think now, why is that? Why do we not have an even distribution of isotopes between the different phases? Okay? Um, uh, and if we look at, um, going back to some thermodynamics here, it, there must be, if this number, if, if K or alpha here is not one, okay, in the case of the equilibrium reactions of a chemical uh, reaction, if uh, if this is one, then delta G is zero, okay? But it's not one, so that means that delta G must not be zero. So there must be something causing some free energy that is driving this isotope exchange to favor, in this case, the heavy isotope being in the water rather than the hydrogen sulfide. So we go back to our our kind of like diagram of, of, of bond energy here and think about what's going on. So we can we can look at them there must be some difference in the kind of the lowest energy state or which therefore re, um, relates to the total bond energy uh, between water and water with the deuterium in it. So there is definitely some difference in between those two and similarly there is some difference in energy between um, the hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide with deuterium. Now, it turns out that the delta G, so that difference in energy can be just rewritten as if we're exchanging isotopes between this phase and this phase, 
Okay, the delta G that would drive that would be this energy minus this energy, okay, which is explained up here. Uh, and we know that we've got this relationship between um, delta G and log K, or in our case, log alpha. Okay, so we can substitute this into this equation here. Okay, so that goes into there. This gives us log K. Um, oh, sorry, this goes into here. So log K is equal to the energy difference here minus the energy difference here. Um, uh, and we know that these are not the same. Okay, because they have different bond strengths. Okay, so different vibrational frequencies. So that that difference between these two is is different between these two phases. Okay, so uh, if we want to think about this, so now the 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 heavier isotope. So if this is uh, if it's uh, uh, greater than zero, that means that alpha is is positive. That means that we're putting um, more of our heavy isotopes um, into the, the basically into the into in this case into the water, okay, and they go into the water because this difference here, this number is bigger than this number, which makes uh, log k positive. If this was um, uh, a bigger number than this number. This would be bigger than this. Log k would be negative, so we'd have a negative fractionation factor, which means the heavier isotopes, in the way that we've defined it, would be going into the hydrogen sulfide. But that's not the case. Uh, log k um, is positive, which means that the water is basically got the bigger difference in energy. This delta E is larger. Okay, so the heavy isotopes always will go if an equilibrium condition into the molecule that has the biggest delta E. Okay, I want to think about what that actually means. Okay, so if you go back to these diagrams, energy diagrams, if you've got this is for instance maybe a weak bond, so this is kind of like stretched out and this one is kind of like more kind of like long and thin. Strong bond has got a bigger difference between here and here. Weak bond, smaller difference, which, which makes these gaps closer together than they are in the strong bond, okay? Which makes that in a stronger bond we have a bigger delta E, okay? Which makes the stronger bonds the, the places where the heavy isotope is more likely to go, okay? So under equilibrium conditions, heavy isotopes will preferentially partition into phases that have the stronger bonds, okay? So uh, we're just going to think a little bit about um, about what's going on here. Um, yeah, we are. So just quickly. So um, this is that reaction again. So we've got water, hydrogen sulfide, but with the deuterium exchanging with water, with deuterium, hydrogen sulfide. Okay, and we've got this relationship here that shows us that this term is bigger than this term. For the water, so we've got a positive um, log k. Um, okay, so the OH bonds in water, okay, this tells us the OH bonds in water are stronger than the the, the, the hydrogen sulfur bonds in hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so think now which of the phases will concentrate the heavy isotopes? So hopefully you'll have you'll have remembered that the heavy isotopes will go into the stronger bond. Okay. So what we're going to do now is, is see if we can work out what the, the difference in fractionation could be. Okay. So if the if the delta D of water is zero, okay, what is the delta D of hydrogen sulfide? Okay. If the fractionation factor is this two point three five, which is which is kind of huge. So we could go back to our uh, equation where we worked out the kind of like the um, the big delta, okay? It's, it's got this relationship, okay, relative to the fractionation factor, uh, or this guy, okay, where we kind of simplified it a little bit more to this log alpha, okay? So we could plug those numbers in, okay? Uh, if we say alpha is this 2.35, uh, 
2.35 minus 1 times 1,000 um, ends up with minus um, uh, minus, well, the, this number here would be um, 1,350. Okay, so that's the difference. If A is 0, then B is minus uh, 1,350. Okay, if we use this equation here, we get kind of this kind of answer. Okay, and you can rearrange that and do it yourself. But the key thing here is that neither of these two equations are appropriate. Okay, because these simplifications only work when alpha is close to one, and we've got small isotope fractionations. Okay, um, so what we're going to do here is just use this equation. Okay, and, and if we if we put uh, a 2.5 in here, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. If we put a 2.5 uh, in here for alpha, and then we start rearranging this equation, so this bit here and this bit here cancels out. Um, a delta a in this case is our delta d of water. We can we've already defined that as zero. So if that's zero, we've got a thousand divided by delta B, which is the thing we want to know, um, plus 1,000 equals um, 2.35. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to rearrange that and come up with the answer of minus uh, 574. Okay, so in this case that we can see that because this is a minus, okay, that tells us uh, if, a, if a delta value is minus, that is it's in, it's, it's got preferentially more of the lighter isotopes, it's depleted in this case, in the heavier isotope, okay. Um, right, so that's uh, well, that's me now. Right, so uh, that's all there is for this introduction. So just to just to recap um, briefly, so there are two types of isotope fractionation: uh, kinetic isotope fractionation and equilibrium isotope fractionation. Um, uh, the mass of the isotopes in a chemical bond. Uh, is what drives this 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 isotope fractionation because they determine basically the bond strength, so how strong the chemical bonds are, uh, and that bond strength for um, the kinetic isotope fractionators determines the reaction rate, uh, and for the uh, uh, for the uh, equilibrium isotope fractionation, it determines the 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 basically the difference. Uh, in energy levels between the different isotopes of each in each type of bond, okay, which then determines where the isotopes will preferentially want to sit. Okay, uh, so that's it for this video. We're going to uh, take this up again in the lecture. Okay, so I will leave it there. Uh, podcast.